employee using just a uh, graphical user interface, interface without typing extra query. So it is com composed of three different uh, uh, items. So the first one is the, uh, the temporal uh, query, and second is the geospatial, and third is the topical. So user can just interact with this environment without typing each query, and the system refresh the output dynamically, combining these queries and generating output. So user can narrow down the query output with the interacting with this system. And this uh, research gave uh, some other inspiration to our idea. Uh, usually the 2D semantic mapping is widely used, and sometimes people have still some question why 3D semantic mapping is uh, needed and what is the actual advantage? But this research by the century in 2008 showed that uh, it had more advantages when we want to give in intuitive exposure to the user with the, the highly interactive environment and give some user some freedom to navigate uh, in dynamic point of view. And then the, this system give uh, not only just a color variation, but give the uh, the intuitive uh, comparison between the different scale of the semantic uh, pyramidal shape or any arbitrary 3D shape on the globe. So we defined our design goal of the business system in order to uh, figure out uh, how we can uh, design the visualization method of the summary, uh, summary of the metadata set. So we want to uh, enable casual formulation of the geospatial semantic query and summarize the, the information from the query with, uh, using the integrated dynamic visualization. And of course, uh, we have to uh, deal with the uh, optimization of amount of data since it should be highly interactive in order to give the good uh, user ex experience to the users. And final uh, item is we have to conform to open standard for interoperability, not only for the distributed data set, but also uh, the, the various kind of applications and the communication among different technologies. So this is the conceptual design. Uh, it is not the uh, rendering from the, our prototype uh, as a the part of the design process, we design uh, this concept. So we start from the uh, 3D digital host model, exactly like the Google work. And then the, we gave uh, we give some vague but highly aggregated uh, summary of the statistical information about the uh, extracted metadata set to the user with this kind of a statistical visualization, and and then the uh, the other uh, the, we we designed a total of five different uh, style of the level of detail of this metadata visualization, but still we are in the same. Uh, of a discrete level of detail. So this is second uh, style is just a simple text tag that gives some readable information, but it just have a very limited information. And the third item is the arbitrary 3D shape object. So since it is dynamically generated 3D scene, any kind of a 3D object can be used to give some intuitive exposure about uh, the sensor system or the status of a sensor using color or shape or the scale of the object. And sometimes we can just put the 3D model of the sensor station into the 3D scene. And the fourth item is dynamic, uh, dynamically generated 2D image spread. Uh, it is the dynamic image generated from the server uh, from the query output of the, uh, the, the metadata that set stored on, in the online database. Uh, in order to give more condensed information than the, just a texture, uh, text tag or 3D shape object, uh, we generate a 2D image including text, icon, or image, and any other 2D component on the limited space of a 2D image. And since it is, uh, even it is dynamically generated, generated it is uh, something like the procedural texture we can map this image on top of any 3D object in 3D scene. And the final one is uh, sometimes people want to see the, something like the summarized latest trend of the actual sensor 
uh, values or kind of latest data. So we designed this total five different level of detail system, uh, level of detail visualization of metadata, and enable this concept. Uh, we have uh, we have to design uh, how we can combine these three components. Uh, in other words, the expected sensor information, and we have to make the, in, uh, the implicit geospatial query to generate interactive 3D scene that give uh, some interactivity uh, with the user. So this question mark is actually the, uh, our prototype system. So uh, to prove the concept, uh, we designed this uh, prototype system. Uh, it is composed with two parts. Uh, server side uh, performed the data processing and filtering of uh, summarized meta metadata set uh, according to the user through test and uh, client side performed the uh, actual user interaction and render the dynamically generated 3D scene in, in standard web browser with X3D player. We hired X3D technique uh, to generate and describe the 3D scene dynamically. And we used the PHP as a uh, overall programming framework and Post GIS was used to extend the geospatial query functionality of post GIS, post Postgres there. And we extracted uh, distribu distribu uh, distributed uh, metadata set using XML API and stored in our own database. And all the uh, metadata uh, visualization template and geospatial query is dynamically generated. So, uh, there was some reason why we chose uh, we employed X3D uh, as a, the basic technology of this uh, describing dynamic 3D scene. Uh, since the uh, recent, uh, these days the KML and the Google Map API is widely used and it, it provides very uh, easy to use uh, interface and environment. So, but uh, there was still the lack of the function functionality like uh, scripting capability. Uh, for instance, we, if we want to specify some function and some node prototype to visualize the metadata, uh, we can define our own node prototype using open standard, but uh, KML and the Google Earth uh, have more the limitations. And in order, as a part of our design process, we applied this prototype implementation to one of the user case. Uh, there was uh, there is a uh, uh, user uh, the contributed project for the personal or weather station project. Uh, there are more than 34,000 uh, personal weather stations registered in the system. And it is highly distributed across the world, not only just uh, uh, America or Europe, but the, the weather station is highly distributed in uh, Asia, Africa, and Australia, etc. So. This is the website of the personal weather station, and they still use the text-based interface to uh, access the data set or the metadata. So we uh, changed this environment to more intuitive, interactive uh, uh, exploration environment. And we, in order to do that, we extract uh, metadata using the XML API, and it is quite straightforward. Uh, we just extracted the meaningful information of uh, the geospatial context and the properties of each sensor, and also use the, some world border data set uh, provided by the statistics division of the national, uh, the United Nations, in order to formulate some casual query about the semantic geospatial uh, query. Uh, it includes different style of country code. And region name, sub region name, and also it has the country area border as a polygon, so we can formulate the geospatial query even though we don't know uh, exact uh, information about the location. But if, if we just know some name of the city or the region, then we formulate the query. And this is the, some cap screen capture from our prototype implementation. Uh, the current stage is just a uh, the proving the concept, so we don't have much interactivity yet, and uh, this uh, different level of detail doesn't have a uh, very smooth uh, transition yet, but we are still improving the implementation. 
The first one is the statistical visualization, and the second one is the very simple uh, 3D arbitrary chain, and it is an example from the text tag, and it shows some example uh, of the problem. So we are tackling with how we can avoid the uh, occlusion problem when we have much of data set on the concentrated area. And also we can, uh, it is uh, 2D image dynamically generated from the server, and we can also combine different level of detail in a single scene and give some interactivity, uh, such as uh, triggering new uh, level of detail when once uh, there is some mouse event or interaction from the users. And this is more complicated uh, combination. And all these steps uh, and the 3D scene is very straightforwardly generated from the uh, actual 3D uh, encoding engine. So <coughs> in conclusion, we uh, propose the visual exploration interface for metadata of sensor web and uh, we generate a dynamic geospatial project 3D scene and, and as a part of a uh, transition uh, from the two-dimensional space with a texture query interface to more dynamic 3D intuitive uh, the visualization and with the, the visual media navigation interface. And as I mentioned before, it is a uh, in-progress uh, project. So our final goal is actually seamless dynamic exploration from the global view to a highly detailed local view for the the specific sensor station uh, which the user are interested in. So in order to enable this, uh, we are extending visual representation and query variation. And also we found some lack of access to the specification, so we are improving the, the standards. And also we are accepting the new trend like HTML5 or CSS3 in order to eliminate uh, some access 3D player from the standard web browser and just putting uh, access 3D element as a part of HTML5 document object model 3. So, thank you. So we have a uh, couple of minutes for questions. Anybody? I, I, I probably missed what, how you explained it, but you talked about statistical visualization. Is yeah. it like the amount of, is there some standard in um, the amount of metadata and that represents so it, it how is, much you captured or? Uh, basically the idea with statistical visualization is exactly the same to this 3D semantic mapping, but since I am more uh, interested in the metadata summary, so once the, there are two a tremendous number of metadata query output from the geospatial query then actually it is harder to visualize in the global view so there are too much so we just uh, in order to give the user more brief information about uh, the overall query output we generate this kind of statistical output according to the region or country so for instance how many weather station is registered in this country so we use that kind of a query to generate statistics from visual data. Thank you. This is nice. <laughs> I think it's, it's, a, it's a very, very useful. I'm uh, just curious. So you, so right now you're working on generate or summarizing metadata. Yeah. Or the interactive explorer metadata. But why not data? Data. Oh, we are also interested in yeah. Dive into data. Yeah. And then you summarize by all your methodology, but instead of metadata, you even show data. So we also consider we are also considering the visualization 3D or 2D visualization of a practical data set from the sensor. So uh, once the user approach it, uh, focus in enough into the specific sensor station through this exploration environment, then actually user probably want to download the actual stream of the data. So we are considering visualization of this kind of trend of the data, and after that, 
uh, we are considering visualizing, visualizing real data in a 3D environment. But uh, still, we have some problem on the, the how we can make a smooth transition from this kind of exploration to the visualization of actual data in local environment. That is actually the challenging issue. Uh, one more question, yeah. which is, uh, how do you know your design, the interface design, is effective? Did you test any user, get some undergrads there? No, you? not yet. So we have to. But uh, still, we are very uh, the early stage of designing. So it is uh, just the current the prototype system is uh, for the purpose of uh, proving the, just the concept, how it works yeah, for this the conceptual design. Last question, comment. When you have the system online, please email us. Okay. <laughs> I think a lot of people will be interested. So. We are only using the open standard and open technique. Every uh, the, the the techniques and APIs are the intellectual property for free. So yeah, we will. Okay. But let's thank our speaker. Next one uh, is uh, Elaine Camayo. Yeah. Uh, he's a PhD student and research assistant in the Geospatial Technology Research Group at the University of Spain. Uh, he has the uh, experience of more than three years working with three related technologies, mostly with the implementation of mobile applications. So his uh, presentation is about sensor observation service time for Android mobile phones. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi everybody, uh, I'm Alain and I'm going to describe the bit about implementation of an SOS client for, for an Android mobile phone. Uh, the motivation for our work was first that the number of sensors and the amount of information that is captured by, by then is growing at the fast at, at, at the factory. Sorry. At the same time, the hardware and software of mobile phones have also had a very rapid evolution, going from very simple devices like this that we have, we have here to very cool devices like these ones. And many users use these devices not only for the phone, but actually it's the last thing that many people do with them is call somebody else. Then, uh, on the other side, we have uh, the SOS specification that provides a work server interface to retrieve sensor and observation data. Uh, the aim of this specification is enhance the interoperability between consumers and producers of the sensor data. Many clients uh, have been developed for this, uh, for this specification, but mostly they have been uh, uh, developed for web and desktop environment, but not for mobile phone. That's why our main goal is to develop an SOS client for the Android platform. Android is a Linux-based uh, operating system developed by Google. Uh, Android was estimated to have, in February of this year, uh, more than 20% of the market share, market share of smartphones. It provides a Java API, and it's very easy to develop with uh, for Android because you can just download up an Eclipse, Eclipse plugin and you can start developing in a few minutes. Uh, in addition, Android is not only executed on mobile phones, it's only executed in other kind of devices like tablets. So potentially, every application that you develop uh, for the phones, if it doesn't use I mean, the call, the call API can be executed in any uh, uh, tablet. Our application has uh, this requirement. It was uh, supposed to run in Android versions 2.2 and above. It has to support the core profile of the SOS 1.0 that have uh, free operation, the basic operation get capabilities, describe sensor, and get observation. It should allow the visualization of the sensor location and other metadata meta related to them. It should support a temporal and spatial filter. It should allow the visualization of observations in tables and charts. It should allow the users to manage easily the server, the information about the server and point they are connecting to. And it must allow the connection to exist in server without the use or, or, of any mediator components. It's like, it's very usual that many mobile applications do not connect directly to many of the web servers that are available online. They connect to a process server that usually try to offer a, a 
simpler protocol to, uh, that fit better the limitation of mobile, mobile phones. Uh, the architecture of the application is shown in this figure. We, the application has a layered architecture, and inside the layer, we have tried to give every component as, as separated from the network as possible because. Uh, in practice, I don't think that the SOS specification has been designed to develop general application. It's more like it covers too many potential use cases. Uh, I think that when you develop an application, uh, it's at least the user interface and many of the domain that should be specific for that application because all the users in different domains do not have the same uh, need for, for example, for visualization of, of the information and all the information do not have the same nature. The data asset layer that, uh, from my point of view, is the most important for me because it's related to my main research, research line. It's composed by a network communication library that have uh, very simple support for the HTTP bindings of the operation in the board profile and have components for XML processing code. Uh, each of these components are called adapters. An adapter exists for every type of response that you can get for the sensor uh, observation service server. You have an adapter for the capabilities files, you have an, an adapter for sensor descriptions, and you have an adapter to decode information related to observations. These adapters have been generated from the SOS schemas using an instant-based approach that I will explain next uh, from a corpus gathered from 56 SOS servers. Uh, the instant-based instant code generation approach is based on the need that, I mean, the complexity of the specification has been already uh, mentioned today. The SOS specification depends on many other specifications. These uh, links that we have here are the set of specification schemas uh, that SOS depend, de depends on. So, if you try to generate code from these schemas for a mobile phone, then is uh, the finite resource is, is a very, very big binary code that do not fit the limitation of mobile phones. So what we tried to do was to uh, design an approach that allows you to, if you have a set of XML documents that your application must process, you can extract from these documents the information about which part of the schemas are you really using in your application. And then, when you generate code, you just generate code for the subset you are really using. The rest you can, you can ignore it. If anybody have any doubt about the complexity of this, the specification, I, I think not. But anyway, uh, here in this image we have the tie definition hierarchy for Gmail 3.11. Uh, the tie definition hierarchy shows the derivation of relationship between types. It's just the subtypes relationship that we have between all the types types that are included in this specification. If we try to visualize all the possible relationships between all of the types in GML311, we get something like this. So that's why uh, it is nearly impossible if you want to cover every case, it's nearly impossible to write all the code manually. Even if you try to generate code from these schemas, many generators fail when they try to do it because they are so big and they keep growing with every new version that uh, there are many specific features that are not, not supported by, by all of the generators. The business logic layer of the application is very simple. We just have a very simple domain models for offerings, observations, uh, procedures, observer property. Uh, here servers for the information about the server endpoint is it's really simple. And the usage of the first in the interface layer, that's not going to describe in detail, just to describe how the user interacts with the application, at first uh, and a screen to uh, deal with the connection endpoints of the SOS server. You can keep on your application a list of servers where you can add or delete servers uh, according to your needs. When you select a server from the list, a connection is established with the server, the capabilities file is downloaded, and then the user can start to interact with the information that is contained there. Once you're connected to the server, you can uh, show the, all of the sensors, I mean the position of all of the sensors that are uh, 
this uh, related to the observation offers in the capabilities files. You can select those sensors, and in order to get more information about the metadata of the sensors, or to or to start uh, to generate a get observation request to get information from them. For map visualization, we have used the Google Maps library, and it's very simple to use in, in Android. Once we select the sensors, we can start to refine all of the parameters that we must send to the, sensor, to the server to get the actual observation. We can define which observer property we want to request. Uh, we can define uh, filters to filter the observation. For example, we can we so far want to support time filters. You can either filter by a period of time or by an instant of time, and you can also specify a bounding box where your, uh, your observations will be located. Once you have all this information, you can send the get observation request to the server and then you can display this information or using uh, a simple table when you have the time for each observation and the values for all of the observations, but you can combine several, uh, several observation types in a, in a chart like this one. The current implementation has several limitations. The first one is that we are only supporting observations for uh, encoder using the observation type. I mean, then the OAN and the specification have a basic observation type and have several derived, derived types. Uh, the current application only supports this type because when you use uh, another one of the derived types, it's it, it happens that you need seven times more space to represent the same information. Usually, informations, uh, uh, observations are encoded when you use the observation type in the result tag and you build a block of observation. If you don't use this observation type and you use one of the, the right type that are defined in OAMN, you can uh, you can put on in this result that only one value for the for for the observations, and then at the at the end you get very very big, very big files that take uh, a lot of time to process to transmit etc. Uh, the client have been built uh, to connect specifically to do two to two type of server that are the 50 to north SOS server and the degree server. In both both server use uh, sweet data write uh, types to encode observation. So far, uh, our application is only able to connect to servers that use this kind of encoding. We also have limitation with the filters that are offered. We only can uh, use temporal filter for periods and instant, and we can only use a special filter for bonding boxes. And another limitation is that only one table can be displayed at a time. And only one type of observation can be displayed at a time in a table. During the implementation, we have faced several challenges and, and open issues. The first one has been, uh, as I explained earlier, the large size and complexity of the schemas that difficult the, the development of, uh, specifically of the data as a slider, because XML data binding tools produce large binaries, and if we try to produce this code manually, uh, is, this is a very error prone and time consuming task. task. Uh, we have also uh, uh, facing other challenges like the constraints related to the display side. Mobile phones have a very small screen, so the amount of, of information that can be shown to the user is not, is not very high. Another challenge has been that uh, the SOS specification is generic and an open to station. That's why in the limitations we have to limit ourselves to use uh, only one type of encoding for observations. And, and of course, if somebody else defines their own model for observations, uh, uh, as it can be done with, uh, with all of them, well, application is not, is not able to break that, that data. And the, the last challenge, and which is an open issue also, is the potentially large volume of data that can be returned by the server. This can represent a problem uh, for several reasons. 
first you have to transmit all this data to to the mobile. Usually, uh, the mobile transmission technologies uh, have suffered from some reliability problems and limited bandwidth. So, uh, transmitting several megabytes of information to the mobile can take a lot of time. At the same time, this the transmission hardware uses a lot of battery power. So, it is very possible that you, uh, your battery does not support uh, this alarm transmission time at the same time. This, if you manage to transmit all this data, this data has to be processed. It can take time and it again consumes a lot of battery power. Well, uh, as, as a conclusion, we can say that we have implemented an Android client for a solar specification that allow uh, users to interact uh, using several basic uh, operations with the servers. We have test. Uh, we have test our implementation with the server I mentioned before, at the 52 North SOS server and the GNU server. And during the development of the application, we have faced a degree of challenge that we were able to partially tackle, but uh, their definitive solutions still remain open. Well, these are the credits for some licensed content that have that have used in the presentation. I have. Some of the images I have taken from Twitter where I published it using some uh, Creative Commons license. And I would, would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, it would be a pleasure to ask. To answer. Thank you. consumption we were well we're still trying we're, we have not measured all these all these metrics yet we have measures yes some of them we just wanted to see if it was possible to connect directly to the servers and get this information visualize information and all this um, uh, just uh, it, because uh, some of your limitations uh, come comes from uh, the limitation of mobile device the yeah. process uh, processing and uh, battery, so uh, well, I'm just curious, you know, why you choose that. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, so I'm trying. You said that large volumes of data was a problem. I'm trying to envision a use case where someone would want to download large volumes of data. Um, I mean, have you? Well, while we were uh, developing the implementation, we tried to get from some SOE servers all of all of the data we could to to uh, filter the schema components that we actually need. Uh, not sure of, of a specific use case where a user might want to download all this data, but we we found files from with more than two hundred uh, megabytes. And I'm not sure right now in a practical application how, how could anybody need to download that amount of information. Yeah, my, uh, it doesn't seem like a serious limitation because you ha as you mentioned, you you know you want to view you only have a certain amount of real estate anyway. So uh, yeah, but for example, if you want to interact for with a server, the first thing that you have to do is get the capabilities files. Sometimes the capability file is very big. I mean, you can have several megabytes of information. The simple, the simple action of 
get the met metadata information of the server itself. Can, yeah, can, can get back a lot, of, a lot of information that you probably cannot manage in your device. Okay. Thank you. Last one. Uh, first, of course. first question is, how do you get the location of the sensors? Through get capabilities? No, with describe sensors. Describe sensors. Describe sensor request to the server. But in this case, you need to send a lot of, a lot of requests, right? E, well, actually, in the application, I didn't show all the screens because there are too many. You can, once you're connected to the server, you can select from the offering list which offerings you want to get your survey, the, yeah. the procedures that are related to those offerings. You don't get all the also, uh, all the procedures related to all of the offerings. Yeah. You can select if you want one offering, two or two hundred. So my question is, let's say you want to see five sensor locations in the yes. on the screen, right? Uh, do you need to send five separate requests or just one? Five separate requests. So, you need so to get, because I mean, in the specification, the display sensor only allowed to get uh, the information about one procedure at a time. Okay, because you have one graph shows you have a lot of sensors, so I'm just curious that, you know, yeah, you yeah. make it. And actually in the spec, I believe, actually, uh, there are different ways to describe uh, uh, sensors. So you don't have to list all the sensors like a list. You can have just use one eh, with a link to, to the yes. list of sensors. But, and that might increase the complexity of your mobile client. And then I have the second question is, uh, did you try to sense SOS? No. No, we can try it later. <laughs> okay. And then actually the third question is actually, Sean has a uh, self-motion again, uh, search anything API. So that would be nice if your phone can link to that API. So basically, you don't just store all the, the, the sensor registry anymore. You just send a query to the API, and you get a list of the query results, and then you directly connect to the SOS. Okay, you show me later the yeah, API. Yeah, talk to her. Oh, there. Raise your hand. Thank you. Well, yeah. <laughs> There's a next part related to this. Uh, oh, yeah. Right? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think this uh, work is very, very interesting. And, uh, so let's thank the uh, speaker again. Okay. definition specific to our group. Um, so the SOS 
the sensor observation service, it does accomplish the goal of transferring data. It does that quite well, um, depending on who you talk to, of course. Um, but we can extend the utility of SOS by designing a system to collect data over across multiple SOS services. So the use case that our team developed was to display all the sensors measuring the same phenomenon from all SOS services. So then, this is a use case representative of a scientist looking for temperature or wind speed. They don't necessarily care how the data is organized online, they just want to get the data themselves. Um, of course, when we started developing a system for this particular use case, we ran into a few problems. Uh, the first being the large variety of the observed property URIs, or Uniform Resource Indicator, representing the same phenomenon. Sensor-centric SOS services, which I'll describe in a second, and non-compliant SOS services. So SOS is not a very mature standard, so we still have problems with some SOS services that are running, but they're not quite perfect and they don't quite fit, fit the standard. So obviously our um, software developers, me being one of them, uh, we have to be careful for how we, we might have to tailor requests specific to a service if we know that it only handles requests in a certain way. Um, and let me explain about number one and number two. When I say we have different observed property URIs is that when you actually want to get data that just says wind speed, we have to look at the observed property. And that's defined generally with a, just a URN, some kind of a name. Uh, the problem is that there's a lot of variety here and you pretty much have to apply almost some kind of algorithm or parsing to figure out what it actually means. And, this, and then the, the problem is you get into the semantic data, you know, what is wind speed versus average wind speed versus wind speed wind speed meters per second, and, uh, it gets quite tricky quite quickly. So this is one of the problems we usually ran into. The second one being sensor-centric SOS services. So an SOS service can, divide, can define an observation offering, and that's a way to organize information on an SOS service. Now, sometimes they'll organize each observation offering to, have a single, to represent a single sensor, which is fine, but that means that every time we want to request data from each sensor, for each observation offering, we can only define one per request. So if an SOS service has 4,000 sensors and each one of them is represented by an observation offering, that's 4,000 unique requests we need to send to that single service. So you can see that there's sort of this redundancy here that might be problematic if you just want to get data and you don't want to deal with the communication itself. To, um, to solve these problems, we propose two things. A logical layer service, to manage heterogeneous observed property URIs, uh, the naming problem. And we also propose a translation engine, and that will provide efficient communication with all the SOS services. Now the contribution of the work um, presented here uh, can be summarized by three points. And first of all, uh, what we're doing here is kind of a look at what SOS looks like today. So it's kind of a nice little snapshot of what does it look like in the real world? What are the, like, what are the services online? What do they look like? And then you know, it's a nice little idea of where to go from here. Uh, obviously, we highlight issues with developing a system to address a common use case, or so if we just wanted to get wind speed from all these SOS services or from the sensor web itself, where are the problems associated with that? And obviously, we present here a system architecture to solve those problems. Um, quickly, just about related work. The OGC catalog service is, um, provides information about available OGC services which is great, which might uh, really help define what services hold what kind of information. Um, obviously, when we look at providing metadata, that's almost uh, theory versus the real world where most people are a bit lazier, unfortunately, and not all SOS services are registered in a catalog service. And if they were, even you need specific uh, software for handling all these multiple requests for these services. Um, you could also use a search engine to look for these services or to look for the data. But again, we have various URNs. Uh, it doesn't account for managing communication with all these SOS services. We still run into the same problems. And so that's why we're going to be proposing a new methodology here. Uh, the overview uh, we can see is, consists of three main components the client, but the two main ones, as I mentioned before, the logical layer service and the translation engine. And we'll get into these right now. Uh, the logical layer service manages and maps um, what we like to think of as a logical concept of an observed property to corresponding phenomenon layers. And the, what that means is when we think of wind speed as a, a logical concept, there's just one idea of wind speed. But you can obviously encode that syntactically very many ways, and that's what has been implemented across different SOS services. 
Uh, and we use a dictionary, or just simply a flat list, to manage the list of our observed properties, which we try to define as unique entities. Uh, and now uh, the dictionary is manually created by a data processing team that interprets sensor data by phenomenon types. So this was created manually while we were looking at sensor data. Um, now the dictionary terms are managed by hierarchies to facilitate user searches. That just means to organize in a particular way that makes it easy to find what you're looking for. Um, the mapping from the dictionary terms to the phenomenon layers is also done manually. The textual information in the observation operating and observation offering the observed property are scanned and interpreted manually and then mapped to the corresponding dictionary terms. Uh, so if you didn't quite catch that, this is what it looks like. Some kind of a hierarchy just to organize everything, so you can kind of click in it, kind of like a folder system on your computer just to make it easier. To so select the dictionary term that you want, like something like air temperature, and that would map to one or many phenomenon layers. Um, and phenomenon layers defined at the bottom here by a service URL, an observation offering, and an observed property, as defined by the, uh, the implementation of the service itself. Now, the translation engine, as I said, is used for communication, and it uh, has four components, a controller, an SOS connector, a feeder, and a cache database. Um, so essentially what this does is the client will make a request and ask for some data. So the controller will look at the request, and if it's a request for recent data, it will check the database and simply return the data as fast as possible. Um, this makes searching a lot easier because you just want to see the last observation for the sensor, just to see where it is in space and just to see it on a map. Uh, if you're actually using this system for more specific queries, then it would use a connect to the SOS connector and send requests out to your SOS services and then act as a proxy for the client. And the feeder obviously automatically scans SOS services to make sure the cache database is up to date. Uh, and lastly, we have a client, which is a web-based front-end. Users will select a hierarchy to organize dictionary terms, and then they use that hierarchy to select an observed property, i.e. Quincy, uh, just coming up in the next slide. Uh, the client automatically loads all the data for that observed property from all the available SOS services. So all they have to do is click wind speed, and they kind of get a sense of where the sensors are that are measuring wind speed. And it's a really easy way to browse information without worrying about handling multiple services and requests. So it's a really good introduction for data exploration. Uh, now we're just going to look at the experimental results of the system. Now data mapping is performed manually, so we're not really going to be focusing on validating the correctness of the mapping. Instead, we're just going to be summarizing the overall mapping. Um, so our dictionary defines 76 observed properties. The mapping obviously defines phenomenon layers, so the user does not need to create multiple requests to multiple SOS services. And by, by example, there's uh, 369 wind speed phenomenon layers that we've defined, and they're across seven different SOS services. But by the click of a single button, the user can browse all that information. <clears throat> so these are the top 10 observed properties with the highest numbers of mapping. So as we see, we have things like horizontal wind speed and wind direction, and uh, quite a few number of mappings across number of different services. Uh, we also have here the number of instances in the real world SOS services and the logical layer service. And what this just means is what's out there now, today. So the blue is, as far as we can tell, the entire sensor web as defined by SOS version 1.0. No. So there's only about 50, I believe, SOS services that we can find. But if you look at unique observation offerings, that number increases. But then when you look at unique phenomenon layers by a third property, uh, the number increases by quite a bit. And we've only really mapped a small subset of this entire space. So it kind of gives you the idea of the breadth or the depth of the sensor web. Um, now, for, ter for uh, data access, to evaluate the performance of data access, we use a system approach versus a naive, naive approach. And so what we decided to do was download recent observation data from sensors, and um, just to get an idea of as I said, as mentioned in the client, what are the sensors that are holding this kind of data? So the data loading latency is using naive versus pro scheme. Obviously, because we use cache to check quickly, we can uh, improve these kind of specific queries, um, the latency by quite a bit, and it scales quite well. Um, so the conclusions: a logical layer service and a translation engine are proposed to solve data access to multiple. 
uh, heterogeneous SOS services. And I like that term, heterogeneous SOS services, because the idea of having a standard is to standardize data access. However, we still find there's enough flexibility here that they can be um, implemented in a few slightly different ways, but they're different enough. Uh, the data mapping aggregates similar phenomenon layers, and our proposed data access scheme is efficient, obviously, when compared to the approach. Uh, in future work here, we can be extending this by investigating automatic or semi-automatic methods of mapping, dictionary generation, and information retrieval. We can try to leverage the recent research in semantic web, data mining, and really opening up the sensor, dev, sensor web to end users for data browsing. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for their attention. I'd like to acknowledge all of our sponsors, and a special um, thanks to my teammates for helping me out in the data processing team at the University of Calgary. Thanks. So you can, uh, if I want to carry the sensor, the observation data from multiple sensors, I just need a single, just a single query, and you can query all the data and give me uh, just one time, right? Yeah, well, that's, by the push of a button on the client end, that's mm -hmm. possible, yes. Okay, so, uh, so does that mean that all the sensor observation service register in this system can be queried in the same way, and how do you push that? Um, they're not necessarily registered. What we actually do is we use software, as already mentioned by Steve, mm -hmm. uh, by other uh, people in our group, to actually search and crawl the web um, to find where these SOS services are. So they're not necessarily registered. We go out and kind of find them, and then what we do is we define these logical concepts to them using phenomenon layers, not just the SO service themselves. So um, in, in that sense, it's, it's very much connect, they're very much connected, like the logic layer service and the translation engine work together. So right now, there isn't an API, it's just the demo and the client. But it, the work obviously could be extended to provide an open service for other people. Yeah, because you already talked about there are some different uh, um, vocabularies for the observed properties, right? Yeah. Is there any other um, difference, differences uh, except for, uh, for this, the uh, other properties? Any other heterogeneities? Um, well, there are some, as I mentioned very briefly, some um, heterogeneous, heterogeneities in the fact that the systems are implemented slightly differently mm -hmm. depending on the implementation itself. And I think this is just because um, SOS is not a very mature standard, but as implementations grow, this is disappearing quite quickly. So the only problem that we're running into now is sort of uh, semantics or semantic interoperability, which is an entire research question on its own, but how it applies to SOS is actually quite a bit different, and it does boil down to um, what the text is for the observed property, or what the text is for the feature of interest, or how you label your observation. I may answer a question. Yeah. So actually, there are a lot of differences between SOS. Actually, yeah. it's a painful process. The, the major one, or most common one, is the swap of land long. Mm -hmm. Okay, a lot of SOS is land long. A lot of them are long that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is one major one. Yeah. And then some, the other properties one, so you can see we have like 400 different means speed, for example, right? Mm -hmm. And then only one means speed, right? So that's one. And then there are other encodings, and some small ones, I mean, one comma missing, those, those type of things. Uh, and then there are, these are just examples, but there are more. And actually part of the work actually is we have the backend process to clean up those things. Just like, it's just like a web, right? HTML is dirty. So it's how you clean up the, the dirty, dirty ones. And then you present, when, when the user look at it, it's like nice, right? But actually it's very dirty. Yeah, it's a lot of work on like, kind of this. Does you, uh, you do that automatically or some, in some automatic way? Some things it can be done automatically. Some, most of the things can only can be done uh, manually. Yeah, like those that long swap, we can check. But what if it's minus 99? I mean, you, have, you can only you know, put those patches into it. Yeah. Any other questions? I actually have one question. Uh, so, do you have any recommendation of um, changing SLS specification so that heterogeneity can be reduced? 
Um, that's a very good question. Uh, <laughs> I'm not up to date with how the talk is going on SOS 2, so I feel like I'd be kind of um, out of the works. But for my, just from looking at SOS version 1, uh, I think the idea of having an observation offering is too ambiguous. That's the only thing I see. I, I understand the need of just about all the other um, data formats, but the observation offering, observation offering as an entity seems to stratify in a, an SOS service, and I don't think people are using it properly. And that's only my idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So tomorrow we have a semantics and uh, apology. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about that, and maybe that might be the solution. Okay, <laughs> that, 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 that's the last speaker. Our last speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Frank Farr. Uh, he's, a, he's a research associate professor in the Geographic Information System Research Center in Fengjia University, uh, Taiwan. And he got his PhD degree from the Department of Civil and High School <coughs> here at Fengjia University. And his research interests include February of flow monitoring, dense light monitoring, and rich monitoring. And his, his paper is a, is a short paper, so he will have a very nice demo, I think, uh, uh, movie to show. Uh, okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Frank Fang from uh, GIS Research Center, Fengjiang University, Taiwan. Today, I will introduce uh, the, the big monitor station in Taiwan, and we implement the sensor web enablement. First, I need to introduce the brief. Uh, since 2002, Fengjia mm -hmm. University uh, helped the Taiwan's government to build uh, all kinds of the brief mountain station around the Taiwan. Because uh, there are 1,500 high potential the brief river around the Taiwan. So, so uh, up to now, we have uh, 18 the brief mountain station, like a permanent station and uh, three mobile station and uh, 14 purple unit around Taiwan. Uh, there are five kinds of main sensor in the purple unit, uh, purple in the, uh, in the market station. The rain gauge, we use the uh, 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 early morning index, use the rainfall accumulated and rainfall intensity. And when the river occur, the flood will break the well sensor. Uh, then we'll send a message to the response center. And we use the dual form to make sure that the brief wall or the flooding and to break, break, break the well sensor. Then we use the water level or water level meter to, to calculate uh, the brief wall discharge. Then finally we use the CCD camera to, to record the brief wall movement. So this uh, is this is a permanent the brief wall mine station. And we set up different kinds of sensors in the upstream, midstream, and downstream. All the sensor data will transmit to the receiving center, and then we use the C band satellite to transmit the all the sensor data, the real time data, to the to a response uh, center. And uh, there are the power generator uh, in the receiving center. We can supply, support at least three days. And passed by during the typhoon season. And we want to extend our monitor scope. We, we set up a new, new uh, meteorological sensor uh, like, the, like this. The most important sensor is soil and water content sensor. So each station we, we, we set up the soil and water content, content sensor, we want to forecast in the debris flow. The debris flow. And this is our, uh, this our um, the brief monitor system. And all, all the sensor st st status will, will display in this system. And when the sensor reach the threshold, uh, the red uh, re re light will switch to a yellow light or a red light. And we can, we can use, uh, we use this system to, to, to monitor all the, all the, the brief event. So uh, it's a cur current vehicle my system. All the sensor data can transmit to a mobile station or a permanent uh, 
permanent station and we use the, the, the CBN satellite to transmit to the emergency response center and all the people can use the cell phone uh, website to, 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 to know all the sensor information. And this is the, the, the brief event in 2009. Um, this event is the, uh, more, uh, the largest scale in Taiwan up to now. The, all, the, all the sensor data will be real time to, to transmit to the response center. So after the debris block, the, um, the bridge and the CCD camera will, will crack. And what happened uh, in the upstream? So we use, we use our, our UAV to take picture in, in, a, in a upstream. Before the debris fall, uh, before, before uh, the um, type of rock, rock, and after the type of rock, we know a lot of red slide, uh, a, a, a lot of red slide area in the upstream. So we will analyze the different kinds of sensors, like uh, the rain, rain gauge, the rain force in, intensity level accumulate, and while sensor break, uh, uh, broken date time, and we use a uh, geophone to make sure that the, the Weibo event and uh, use a system camera to, to, to provide the government. And we also, uh, in Taiwan, uh, the, the waveform velocity is very fast, about the, the, the 17 per, per meters per, per second. So when the waveform occurs, you, you can run away. So. Uh, there are 1,500 1, hypertension rivers in Taiwan. So, but we only have 22 permanent stations. So since 2003, we designed a, put a mobile monitor station. We want the, during the type of season, we can dispatch the mobile station to a high potential river to monitor it the before. So it's a one generation, one generation, second, third, and fourth, or fourth, fourth generation. The fourth generation station is, is finished uh, the last year. So select the transformer. So, so, but, but it's like uh, a very heavy. So we, we just rebuilt a new four mobile station like this. It's more, more, uh, it's, it's more strong and more fancy and more uh, easy to operate. So we, we, maybe we can call it four S mobile that we want to <laughs> Uh, in 2006, uh, 2009, uh, a very, very important event in in the uh, in the Xiaomi village, uh, south south of the tai, tai, Taiwan. We use uh, this our uh, UAV to to take uh, to take a video. Here, there are almost 500 people dead in here because the the, uh, the mountain of the power current less like so about five, uh, five, five hundred people get here so so we, we uh, this video is very important uh, to tip to provide the government after the, the people event and the Lensa event so in this case uh, we, we find a couple cases occur in the in the Shari village and this is a Shari village, village uh, pre typhoon and the post typhoon pictures. So this kind of, uh, this kind of, this kind of, of hazel, uh, this type of hazel will occur one with another, like the, uh, maybe occur the left side in the upstream, and then it will, will, will occur the debris fall in the midstream and downstream. So the new thought about the basin wide mountain network has been considered in Taiwan. So uh, we set, set up uh, uh, the on-site station is, is, is on the downstream to, uh, to, to monitor the people and uh, then during the typhoon season we will dispatch the, the mobile station to the mystery and then we have a new product we call a portable unit uh, in the, we set up, set up the, the, the upstream and all the sensor data also can transmit to the mobile and the uh, portable unit uh, portable station, sorry, uh, 
the answer station to transmit the, the, the sensor the data to the response center. Uh, so we, we uh, from the point line to plane, we extend to the upstream and the source of the people uh, consider the whole watershed, and we combine the on-site mobile and portable unit. And the, we also integrate different uh, agencies in Taiwan. So what is portable unit? The portable unit design concept we want to easy to up, to transport uh, and easy to upgrade. And uh, important, we, we implement uh, the OGC uh, standard in this uh, product. So this portable unit. So we can we can carry carry on and uh, so we want to, um, the almost uh, 35 kilograms. Uh, so we can I, I have been carry on in, in my in my bag. So there are five uh, there are four four important sensors integrating the portable uh, unit, uh, including the rain gauge, geothermal, soil water content sensor and uh, the CCD camera. So uh, they are at least uh, uh, continue to operate at least uh, five days uh, by itself. So we if, uh, well, they are the hardware we call, call a PSC portable com controller, uh, portable, portable oh, sorry, programmer automatic controller, and uh, we have a software we call a Swiss Swiss server to, to embed it to our portable unit. So different kinds of agents in Taiwan can use the uh, SOS uh, to observe the data and uh, use the SPS to control the, the, the sensor. So what is the S uh, 3C server? The 3C server uh, can, can uh, observe all kinds of sensor data and can provide to the uh, application by the S SOS, SPS, and WS. So, so, this, this diagram shows uh, the uh, 3C server component. It, uh, we can observe the uh, SOS, uh, WS, and database, and store it in the uh, database server. The important we, we provide the SOS service, SPSS service, and WS service. So we, we have a, a real, real application in our portable unit. Last year, 2010, the, the important event uh, during the Maybe the uh, Taiwan maybe. So um, Taiwan maybe occurred uh, the next time in uh, in uh, at the uh, number nine highway uh, the eastern of Taiwan. And occurred occur this time, then uh, a, a lot of people that died in this case. So what happened in the upstream? So uh, there are a lot of less uh, less time. Uh, event on the lesser area in this mountain. So we dispatch our uh, uh, portable uh, mobile station and uh, we set up uh, the portable unit to the to the uh, upstream because we uh, uh, let a break. Maybe the next typhoon may, uh, will will occur the uh, next time again. So we set up the, the portable unit uh, in the upstream. And we provide the data to uh, the real time data to the emergency center. So uh, we implement a Swiss, Swiss uh, uh, sorry, we implement a Swiss uh, standard in our monitoring station. So we, we can provide uh, different kinds of sensor data. You can you can use uh, uh, we provide different kinds of sensor data by the SOS service and uh, provide an IP. Happy to to uh, to, uh, to publish in our uh, service platform. A conclusion. So uh, we use various te technical and complex monitoring and management system to provide a complex type of uh, hazards in the real time data, and uh, we integrate information and data from agency by OGC three uh, three standard. And then we, uh, our portable unit, uh, including the PAC, battery, CCD camera, uh, geophone, and uh, the software is the Swiss server. And our portable unit has been quite uh, successful, uh, less than the voluntary and the provided Swiss, and the Swiss standard to a different agency. So thank you for your attention. But finally, I have a, a website to show, show you. 
we have a We have a SOS generator right now, but it not, it's not an open source yet, but in the future maybe an open source. So you can, you can, uh, you can download our SOS uh, generation, and we have a demonstration video, you can see our demonstration video, and uh, so you can download and to test uh, our, our SOS uh, generation. Okay, thank you for your uh, answer.